I'm uh, Professor Nick Lane uh, from University College London. All right, and what are you a specialist? What are you an expert in? Uh, broadly in bioenergetics, uh, which is to say the energy of life uh, and why it's such a peculiar mechanism. It's not something anybody would have guessed. So I, I, I've kind of followed that right back to the beginning, to the origins of life. How did uh, the, the, the kind of energy that powers life arise? Okay, and uh, Nick, are we alone in the universe? I hope not. You hope not? All right. I imagine that there'll be plenty of bacteria out there. Then why do you hope that we're not alone? Um, because... Because you're because so I, No, because I think that the, the, there should be some principles governing the origin of life, and it seems to me that they shouldn't be that difficult. From what I know about the origin of life on this planet, so carbon chemistry, water, the kind of reactions, hydrogen, CO2, none of it seems too difficult. So in principle, and this, why else would you bother studying the origin of life if you thought it was impossibly difficult to start? You, you know, you do well, it in the lab. People study the origin of English, but no one hopes yes. that there are English speakers elsewhere. Uh, yeah, and I don't expect to find an English speaker elsewhere. Right, so but, yet uh, people study English. Yes, I, I'm studying the origin of life because I would like to come up with a way of, of, of trying to demonstrate in the lab in a fairly short period of time what are the principles underpinning the emergence of life, at least on Earth, and I would like to think that those principles are generalizable in some way, uh, and therefore it's kind of important to me, I suppose, in that sense, that, that those principles shouldn't be extremely difficult. Now, you say you would like to believe that they're uh, generalizable, but you also suspect that they are. I suspect they are. It's not yes. just a hope. That you, you no, have it's not good, a hope. You I, have think, some... I think they are, but I'm also aware that I'm wrong about a lot. Okay, so <laughs> what is the best evidence you have that these principles that we think are behind the origin of life on Earth are behind, would be behind the origin of life elsewhere? Well... <clears throat> It's, it's thinking about the nature of life on Earth and whether or not that makes sense more generally. So does it make sense that life is cellular? Would you expect to find life being cellular elsewhere? And viruses, of course, are okay, let's know, stop and ask you that question. alive. But okay, let's stop and think about that question. Yeah. What's the, what do you think is the answer? I th suspect that for organic life, yes, it would, it would tend to be cellular. Why couldn't you have viruses as in, I guess, the Martin and Coonan 2005 article that you talked about, about you can have viruses that are not parasitic on any pre-existing cellular life, but on the pre-existing, I guess, rock uh, free energy gradient. It's possible for that. Um, I liked that paper a great deal when I first read it. I've gone off it a little bit since then, not for the paper itself, but because of the, what, the perception of how life would start in vents taking over open pores. Um, it seems to me, well, we tried to model some stuff and uh, we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to model, I don't want to get too technical on this, but whether or not it would be possible to drive the kind of protein machinery that you see in modern cells, like an ATP synthase, for example, that makes the energy currency of life. And the question is, well, if it were just sitting there in a membrane in a vent, can we work out whether the, the natural gradients, the iron gradients in these vents would be enough powerful enough to drive this machine to work. And, and, and you start thinking, well, what do we need to know here? Well, you need to know what are the substrates, what are the, what are, what are the materials that it needs to operate, where are they coming from, what's the concentration of them? You realize you have no answer to any of those, and then what's the product? Well, it, it disappears off somewhere else as well, so how can selection act if you've got stuff coming in from some unknown place and, le and the products are leaving to some unknown place? It made me realize that cellularization is important uh, as a way of keeping the inside in and keeping the outside out. Uh, and, and so I, I now have problems with the idea of seeing the entire vent as a kind of a living system. Oh. That's not to say it's wrong. It's just that I personally now have problems with that idea. So you suspect that there's life elsewhere, and you say at least bacterial life, mm -hmm. and you think it's therefore cellular life. You don't envision planets full of viruses living off of hydrothermal vent gradients. I don't envisage that. It's possible that that would happen. I, I think that if that were the case, then it would be quite strongly limited form of life because there's a limit to just how far vents can take you, um, depending on the system. But by and large, once you've got as far as photosynthesis, then you've freed yourself from a, a fairly small energy flow, fairly tight and, and, and focused energy flow. 
Now you use the word as far as photosynthesis, and that reminds me, that makes me think that there's some linearity to the evolution of life that you're implying for life elsewhere. Um, not necessarily. It's really a case of resource use. Um, is it possible to get beyond very small focal places where I imagine that it's just as possible for life to collapse, perhaps, or to fall extinct? Um, in a place like Mars, is there still life today? The, the actual resource flow is so low that if there is, it's certainly not impacting on the planetary atmosphere or anything like that, beyond possible traces of methane. It could be elsewhere that there's a, a lot greater flow, but it, it, do, it does seem to me from, from our experience of life on Earth that, uh, that photosynthesis allows you to make much, you know, step up by probably orders of magnitude in, in, in uh, just how much life can take over a planet. Now, let me ask you again, are we alone in the universe? Well, I would imagine that there will be bacteria out there. It would be a little disappointing if we didn't even find bacteria in our own solar system. Uh, I would be rather surprised to find what I would describe as large morphologically complex life. That's, um, it's only, it only arose once on Earth. That doesn't necessarily mean it's improbable, of course, but it, it does raise some interesting questions about why. And again, I think we can apply principles to it. And those principles effectively are why do bacteria and archaea as a sister group to the bacteria um, they're biochemically very complex, they're genetically very complex, they're kind of structured in a different way where they have large complex metagenomes. Um, but, you know, there is no, I doubt very much that we'll ever find anything of the level of complexity of a flea composed of bacterial cells. So you think that, uh, you said morphological complexity only arose once, so you think that stromatolites are not morphologically complex? Not in the not not in relation to a flea. So a flea is more morphologically complex than a than a giant stromatolite. To my mind, yes, because it's it's differentiated in a in a rather more complex way. One stromatolite is pretty much the same as another stromatolite. To my eye, that probably gets oh, the stromatolite gosh. biologist <laughs> in a fury, I suspect. But uh, uh, my flea I mean, is more complex than all of this I'm giant not. stromatolites community. <laughs> I'm not particularly, I would say, eukaryocentric, uh, ah. but I do think there is a problem to solve there. I, oh. I, I think there is a difference in morphology between the two. So in the question, are we alone, what does the word we mean to you? To me, it means life uh, as a whole. So life I would include whole. bacteria in we. I didn't know life was a whole. Life on Earth is a whole, yes, I, I think so. It, we share the genetic code, we share the same okay. cell structures. Uh, so life is I, all. So some I, people I, think... I feel quite a strong fellow feeling with bacteria. Okay. Um, so about half the people I interview think of we as we the intelligent creatures on Earth. So they've, they've excluded every other species. I, what do you think of that use of we? Well, I think that's what most people would mean by we, and I think that if we if we, meaning humans now, if we find life somewhere else, uh, most people would be disappointed if it turned out only to be bacteria. Um, but not you. I, I think I would, well, I, 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 I would be pleased in the sense that I think it would imply, you see, what is it? Would we even recognize it? What I imagine we would find would be cell-like things, not a million miles away from bacteria, using carbon, probably in water, uh, not because it's the only way of organizing it, it's just that carbon is very good at that kind of chemistry. It's very common in the universe. Water is ubiquitous. Um, we know from the principles of life on Earth that all this stuff works, and we know it's thermodynamically favored. So I, I think just statistically, I would expect maybe you know, 900 times out of 1,000 that life would be organized in a similar way to life here. That's not to say it can't be different, it's just probably it's, it's going to be similar. Now, if we get to complex life and... and we get beyond organic life forms into, into uh, post artificial intelligence, post-biological, uh, then anything goes. Uh, and maybe that's what we should be looking for. Now, you used the word complex, yeah. and I, it's a fraught word. Yes. And do you think that as life evolved, as life has evolved over the last four billion years, that it has gotten more complex? Yes, I do. Uh, what, I'm, going to, I'm going to defend my use of the word complex because I can see that some people will say, no, of course it's not, everything is equally evolved. 
uh, and they have a point. Um, and I would define complexity not really as genetic complexity, because if you take it purely as genetic complexity, E. coli, may a single cell may have 4,000 genes, but the metagenome, the pool of genes in E. coli around the place might be in the order of 30,000 or more. <clears throat> and so that's a level of complexity equivalent to the human genome or more complex than the human genome. But it's organized and structured in a different way. Um, and, you know, you, you might say it's structured in a similar way to an ant colony or something, but I, I think an ant colony has taken that level of eusocial behavior a long way beyond anything that you would see in E. coli. So I, I'm def I would define it as morphologically complex, meaning cells are larger and have a lot of stuff in them. But not um, biochemically complex. No, I would say we are biochemically quite simple in comparison mm. to bacteria, simpler than bacteria. Mm. In terms of our metabolic biochemistry, we're really limited. In fact, we have about, across the entire domain of eukaryotes, about the same degree of metabolic sophistication as a single bacterial cell. So it sounds like bacteria then have access to a more complex metabolisms. Than they do, but they, they haven't used it for whatever reason to give rise to more complex morphologies beyond the kind of um, stromatolite type structures beyond uh, biofilms, that seems to be a limit. Some multicellularity, some degree of differentiation and complexity, but nothing, as I say, to compare with the flea. Okay, now uh, in the question, are we alone, what does the word alone mean? Ah, uh, well... It, the reason I'm asking you this is because a lot of, we're social mammals, and yes. we like, the word alone implies, it has a little bit of a stigma to it, and it's better if you're in a group and just talking and happy and I mean, dancing. I, I think in some sense we already are alone. It depends, I guess, exactly what you mean by alone. Um, well, we you... can't easily hold a conversation with a dog or a dolphin or something. I think we can see intelligence, we can see consciousness, we can communicate in some way, but um, and probably for a lot of people that would be enough companionship not to feel alone if you're there with a dog. Um, well, do you think so, humans are alone on Earth? I certainly think that we have a level of complex um, brain power and consciousness which has developed to a far greater degree than anything I see around us. That's not to belittle those things and I think we share consciousness right across not just even the animal world, I would see it going down to the level of cells, some kind of flickering of consciousness. So I, I don't feel alone on Earth, but I do think that there is something uh, different about humans. Isn't there something different about every species? Well, there is, but we are humans, and we, uh, we also have a power to destroy the Earth at the moment that uh, we, is probably unique. Destroy the earth, but destroy, do you mean destroy, destroy ourselves? A, destroy ourselves, destroy a large part of life on earth, um, not the bacteria, yes. I think if we take ourselves out, we'll give it five million years and it will be indistinguishable apart from us, yes. <laughs> so, all right. So we have the ability to destroy ourselves. Is the yes. question, are we alone, an important question? It's not a driving question for me. Uh, it's certainly an interesting question. It's, I can see it's a driving question for others. Uh, I'm more interested in the principles of what governs the emergence of life on a planet uh, with a certain set of resources. Can we understand it? We'll never know what happened. So we'll never know how life started on Earth. But you said but you were we, motivated to study that because you were sure or you hoped very much that it existed elsewhere. Um, no, I... I'm motivated to study it because I would like to understand the principles that govern the emergence of life. And if those principles are enormously difficult, if it turns out that it's a freak statistical accident, then it, there's little point in studying it, and we would gain, it seems, very little. If, if, on the other hand, those principles are reasonable, intelligible, uh, that we can study them in the lab and demonstrate that the steps that we propose are plausible and that we can, we can demonstrate it, then I think that's as close to understanding the origin of life we can get. And if those principles are generalizable, then as a scientist, that's a pleasing, it's a pleasing thing. I'm not sure it's any more than pleasing to me personally as a scientist. So let me try to understand what you just said. You said, if you find out how life arose here, you'd then be able to figure out whether the method in which it arose was generalizable to elsewhere or not. And right now you cannot do that? 
Uh, no, I don't think we can do that because we can't agree among ourselves as an origins of life community what were the conditions, what were the circumstances under which life arose on Earth. I'm so what are, what are the possibilities for that? What are the, the leading candidates for well, that scenario? Well, I would scenario? say within the field itself, probably the leading candidate at the moment would be terrestrial geothermal systems, starting with cyanide and powered by UV radiation. There's been a lot of rather beautiful chemistry Those done. Those are two things you just said? Or one? Well, that would be one thing. So in a terrestrial environment, in some kind of geothermal pool. Okay, by terrestrial, um, you mean on land? On land. Okay. That's a, yes, I beg your pardon. Um, and, and, and cyanide chemistry, it works well as chemistry. The problem that I have with that is that it doesn't link up very well to the biochemistry of cells. I'm a biochemist and I would like to see some continuity between geochemistry and biochemistry and there's not much there to me. That doesn't mean again that it's wrong, I, it's, I, it's just me as a person would like to see some continuity. Now, um, what does life do then? Uh, and it seems that the Again, I can't prove it, but it seems reasonable that the, the earliest forms of life were autotrophic, which is to say they grew from gases, um, gases found in normal geological environments through an energy flux, which is equivalent to cells that we see today, which is to say what all life does today is, is a very simple phrase from Mike Russell is hydrogenate CO2, which is to say add hydrogen onto carbon dioxide to make organic molecules. That is the structure of biochemistry in cells, and, and, and different cells can get hydrogen from all kinds of places. They can strip it out of water. They can get it from hydrogen sulfide. There's, but it also comes bubbling out of the ground as hydrogen gas. Uh, and that seems to be the simplest form of life imaginable as, uh, as life on Earth. It's, it's reacting hydrogen and CO2, and they don't react easily. The way that cells make them react is to, is to effectively use an electrical charge on a membrane, and there are environments like deep sea hydrothermal vents that provide you for free with a, a, an equivalent electrical charge across a barrier, and I, I think that that's the way to see the question. I'm confused by, you keep on using the word life, and mm. yet, presumably as a scientist, you think that life evolved from non-life. Yes. And presumably as a scientist, you don't think there's a sharp boundary or no. a phase transition associated with that? Or how do you imagine <clears throat> this transition and yet you still insist on saying life and non-life? Uh, I agree with you. Um, it, it's, a, it's a continuum. I think there are some phase transitions probably and the origin of genetic information is probably one of them. It's not something I'm really studying myself, though we are doing some modeling work to try and work out how evolvable can a geological system be, um, be, be uh, along the path to getting to cell-like things that we would most people would understand as life, uh, how far can you go down that line before you have genetic inheritance? I think the answer is quite a long way, but um, you get to a point where, where it's no longer evolvable. It effectively at least in, our, in, our, in, our, in my understanding of it, in our modeling of it, you get to a point where you're capable of producing protocells, capable of making copies of themselves with a d degree of sophistication. Uh, but getting beyond that um, to specializing to different niches and so on, I don't see the way without genetic inheritance. Hmm. So do you have a working definition of life that you use? But no, I, I deliberately avoid having one. Uh, what, I, what I quote to a lot of people is a, is a lovely quote from Peter Mitchell, uh, who was a, a pioneer, not really of the origin of life field, but of, of, of this idea of membrane bioenergetics, that, uh, that essentially all cells, with very, very few exceptions, are powered by usually proton gradients across the membrane. So on one side of the, the membrane surrounding the cell, you've got a high proton uh, concentration on the inside, a low proton concentration. Protons are, of course, the, the positively charged nuclei of hydrogen atoms, so they've, they've got a positive charge, you're pumping them out and you're putting a charge on the membrane too. That's as universally conserved across life on Earth as the genetic code itself, which implies as a mechanism it's very early, and it's not something anyone ever predicted. It's not something that kind of emerges from a chemical understanding of the, the biochemistry of cells. Do you think that was the first energy currency preceding ATP? Yes, I think so. Now, so, do you, so what do you think that you say a proton gradient? What about sodium or calcium or other it ions? Could that be, could easily... It could be any of those. The fact on, of life on Earth is it tends to use proton gradients, and we know particular environments that do use proton gradients. And the reason I think protons um, is because pH, which is to say the proton concentration, 
can modulate the reactivity of both carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Now, sodium concentrations wouldn't do that. Oh. But protons, if you've got hydrogen gas in alkaline fluids, hydrothermal fluids, which is what you get coming out of these hydrothermal vents, um, hydrogen is more reactive in alkaline conditions. It really doesn't want to push its electrons onto something else. But if it's in alkaline conditions, it pushes its electrons onto something else, and the protons are left behind, they will react immediately with the hydroxide ions to form water, which is thermodynamically very favored. And so it's far more likely to push its electrons onto CO2 if it's in alkaline solution. Now, CO2 itself, it doesn't really want to pick up any electrons and become reduced to an organic molecule. But if it's in a relatively acidic environment where there's protons available, it picks up a, a negative charge. It doesn't want another negative charge. It's going to try and repel that. But if there's a proton around, it picks up the proton. Now it's neutralized the charges, pick up another electron, another proton. So it's much easier to accept electrons in an acidic environment. And this is the structure of these vents, and it's the structure of cells, and it's how these earliest, most ancient cells we know about actually do uh, fix CO2. They use the proton channel in the membrane, which effectively locally acidifies an environment and allows this reaction to proceed. So I think that's fundamental, simple, uh, work, works well, and it's, it, it's testable in the lab. Well, Yuri Milner, Yuri Milner experiment, you know, 1953 or something, they did with reducing gases. Can you do what you just described in a lab with an alkaline and acidic gradient? We are trying to do that. We've had some success and quite a lot of failure too. Uh, and the problem we're having really is, uh, is, is, is reproducing the successes we have had. Um, the big problem for, for us really and for anyone working on this is that hydrogen gas is not soluble in water uh, at atmospheric pressure. What we really need to do to make this work is to ramp up the pressure in the system to 300 bars, uh, and then we need a continuous flow. For this to work again, you need a laminar flow across a barrier, then it should work. We don't know. We haven't got the funding to build a high pressure reactor. We're collaborating with a group in Utrecht to do that. That's, that's to me, if we can do that experiment and then it fails, then my confidence that this would be a suitable okay. possible origin of life would take a serious knock. Now, uh, science seems to have created this, all, this, you could say that science has created a genesis story, a story of our origins. Yeah. And <clears throat> we scientists think it's very important, but not everybody does. Well, does knowing this story change your life at all? Does it make you a better person to know that you evolved from something earlier and that you're connected with the rest of life? A <laughs> very philosophical question. Um, it might change my life. I think it would change... I think, you know, to make one you thing, happier or a thing, better person or something? No, I don't imagine it would. <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, that's a question about the meaning of life, really. Why are we here? What are we doing? What's important to us? What, why should we struggle to do anything? And I think most of the answers to those questions lie within society itself. That, um, you know, I, I don't see a greater meaning that we've been put here as a species that we're exceptional in any way. We're just another species. We're very similar to pretty much everything else. Uh, and, and I think what we've done that's good has been the achievement of society as a whole. And I think a lot of people within society, yes, I think humans have a need for an origins myth. And that origins myth, if it happens to bear some semblance to reality, I think a lot of people are genuinely interested to know what can we say about the origins of the universe, about the origins of the solar system, about the origins of life. Can we as you know, puny-brained humans come to... Through, through logic, through experiments, through thinking about it, through observations, come to an explanation for how life came to be. It's, it's a grand question. It would be wonderful to know the answer. I think a lot of people uh, would love to know that answer. And I personally would love to know that answer, even if my own views on the subject turn out to be completely wrong. Hmm. Okay. Let's see. How about... Um artificial life. Do you think that in a hundred years or a thousand years or 10,000 years, we biological wet slime bags will evolve into some type of silicon based computer life that will then explore the universe and then kind of leave our biological roots behind? I don't find that a very pleasing prospect, um, but it, it seems... Why that, not? Why not? Um, it seems to leave behind all the human foibles that we are familiar with and used to, and I think it's a, it's a slightly chilling prospect for a lot of people. It seems rather than 
it seems to be the end of humanity as we know it. Now, maybe that's not a bad thing. Um, you know, if you've got kids, you kind of think, what kind of a world am I bringing into? Where, 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 where is it leading? I mean, it seems to be inevitably leading in the direction of AI. Um, and some of these more dystopic science fiction <laughs> movies seem to uh, have a you know, scary relevance to the, 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 the direction of travel at the moment. Should I be scared about that? Well, probably not. Would, would it be better in the long run that, uh, that, that either we evolve or we produce machines capable of exploring the universe? Well, that would be far more thrilling, really. I think, uh, yes, it would be. Exploration okay. is, is probably a big part of humanity, and if we can somehow you know, progress that exploration out, even if it's not us, that's okay. a good thing. I forgot to ask you a question when we, were, when we were talking about the definition of life. I forgot to ask you whether you think viruses are alive. Yes, I do think they're alive. Um, not for the obvious reasons. There's a funny story here, actually. I, I um, was invited to do some filming with a, with a, with a BBC uh, production unit. And, um, uh, and, and it was actually, it was about cells, but they, they, they've been asked to tell a story. And the story was about the viral infection of a, of a cell. And I said, well, I don't know anything about viruses. And they said, no, we just want to know a little bit about early evolution. So I said, great, well, I can talk about early evolution and cells, but I can't really talk about viruses. And they said, okay, no problem. And they flew me out to Iceland to some black sand beach that I think had been used in some, some science fiction movie. Um, and they said, right, so Nick, uh, what can you tell us about how viruses uh, kind of drove the early evolution of life? And I said, oh, God, guys, come on. <laughs> I said, no, this is a film about viruses. So I had to think <coughs> quickly. I had a feeling this might be coming, so I, I, I'd, I'd thought a little bit. But um, what I found myself saying was that viruses are parasitic on their environment, and they can afford to be very simple because their environment is very rich. They live inside cells. Everything that they need is provided for them. But plants or parasitic are in their environment. They still need CO2, they still need water, they still need light. Is there anything that's not parasitic? Well, I, I mean, I wouldn't hesitate to call it a definition of life, but life as a rule is parasitic on its environment and the level of parasitism depends on the sophistication of the environment. So in that sense, viruses use the, the richness of their local environment to make copies of themselves and they behave uh, with the kind of low cunning that's characteristic of life so i think of them as alive yes is there anything that you that was is mildly parasitic that predated viruses that were even closer to an abiotic well, cycle if you if Some. you yes i mean viruses are quite sophisticated in the sense that they're forming virion particles and they're right. infecting other right. cells but uh transposable yeah. elements and things yes. uh, you know selfish selfish genes i right. suppose well, in the broadest sense is there anything pre-viruses that was a little bit more like uh, non-biology, something in between, because always looking for the missing link. If, yes. if viruses, are, you said, are alive and a hydrothermal vent system is not alive, then what's in between those two? Uh, well, protocells of some sort, in my mind. I mean, I, I think the, uh, the trouble with viruses is that they do need a sophisticated environment to make copies of themselves. Same with selfish jumping genes, uh, transposable elements and so on, they, they need to be in, in an environment where they can take advantage of something which is converting the environment into copies of themselves. Uh, and as a rule, this is changing with the discovery of all these giant viruses, but as a rule, um, you need some form of metabolism to convert the environment into copies of yourself. Now, it's, it's possible to have some kind of protocell with some form of metabolism without any genetic heredity. It's possible in principle. But wait, wait, but isn't... Is it alive? Uh, well, aren't crystals doing that? They're turning the environment into copies of themselves? Well, they are, yes. So is that something are that's in between, in between viruses and, I don't know, hydrothermal vent? In a technical sense, it might be. Um, it, I, I don't personally find that. I mean, I, I, I read some of those ideas years ago, uh, Graham, Ken Smith, and thought it was thrilling. Um, over recent years, I, I don't really see the need for a, a, a kind of genetic intermediary between, um, between an RNA level of genetic replication and some other form of replicator. There's no... There's no suggestion that it's there in biology. There's no suggestion that I know from geology that it's capable of giving rise to, to more complex systems or to having an organic takeover. It seems to add in a layer of unnecessary complexity. 
Um, so I pr much prefer to get straight into organic chemistry and straight into metabolism as we know it. Really, why is metabolism structured this way? There has to be thermodynamic underpinnings for it, otherwise it wouldn't happen. It has and to no have arisen in the absence with of genes. That, no one yeah. disagrees with <laughs> but, but it has to have arisen in the absence of genes in my mind, and therefore okay. there must be environments which are favoring yes. uh, proto cells with this kind of metabolism, making copies of themselves anyway. And I, in my view, they had to get better at it, otherwise RNA is just never going to, to well, appear. Well, there are two views about which came first, the you know RNA world information first or yeah. the metabolism first. Do you take a are you an ideological promoter of either one of those? What I've just been saying would suggest I would say metabolism first. I don't see it that way because um, life as we know it has both. And the people who say uh, genes first are in effect saying, well, there's plenty of nucleotides, there's plenty of RNA, the environment's providing it for free without worrying themselves too much about what kind of an environment is going to provide all of that for free. And by definition, an environment which is effectively metabolically sophisticated enough to provide nucleotides is non-living and therefore not part of the question. So they're just pushing it aside. Yeah. I would say that the, the whole m metabolic side is needed to give rise to genetic information and nucleotides in an RNA world in the first place, that it would be a dirty RNA world contaminated with fatty acids and amino acids uh, and, and sugars and things, um, and uh, and uh, you, whether you define it as life or living or not is really, you know, it's a matter of opinion. It's a, as you say, it's a continuum. You can draw a line wherever you want, or healthier not to draw a line at all. Uh, and so I think there has to be some form of an environment capable of giving rise to some form of proto metabolism, which is capable of giving rise to nucleotides. Um, so that puts Which you in is, the metabolism first camp. It would put camp. me in the metabolism first camp, but I dislike the, the tag. You dislike the tag? Because I, I, I think it's simply about where do you draw a line across a continuum. Okay. So I think the tag is a, you know, an irritating tag. Okay. Uh, how about the role of UV in the origin of life? Do you think UV radiation played any role? I can't rule it out. Um, it's interesting to me that life, as a rule, does not use UV radiation as an energy source. Um, and the kind of chemistry that's been done using it doesn't resemble biochemistry as I know it. Um, and the kind of environment I'm talking about is deep sea hydrothermal vents. And the question is, well, does it have to be deep sea? Could it be, could it, could it be same systems on land? They yes, exist yes. on land. They yes. perfectly could. So it's perfectly like feasible. Uh, well, they're not alkaline hydrothermal vents, oh. but there are, there are vents in Oman, there are vents in California of this uh, serpentin oh. serpentinite-hosted systems where it's alkaline fluids rich in hydrogen gas. Where in California are they? Or? A place called the Cedars, Northern California. The Cedars? Yeah. Okay, so this is where Jill Banfield and her group produced that hug paper that we talked about. I, did she go to the Cedars? I, I wasn't aware so. she went to I the Cedars. So. Okay, I'm not quite she, sure either. She may well have done. Okay. It's Ken Nielsen is the guy. I ah, Ken it. Nielsen. Mostly okay. He's done yes. a lot of work up in the Cedars. Yes, good. Another good friend of Lynn Margulis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes people argue about the unit of selection in biology. Do you have anything to say about that? Uh, it's a bit of a sterile conversation. Um, I suppose I think of it as the cell. Um, that's not to say that it, it can't act at the level of genes, of course it can. It does all the time. Any, any selfish gene uh, is, is acting in its own interests. Um, I think the trouble with looking at selection only at the level of genes is it, it tends to downplay the importance of genetic conflict in a strange way, that if you have levels of selection, you can have, for example, I, I think a lot about mitochondria, which are, um, they were bacteria once, they're the power packs inside eukaryotic cells. Um, now, once they get inside an, another cell, inside another prokaryote originally, then they have an agenda of their own. They're making copies of themselves, and it's the speed at which the bacterium as a whole is making a copy of itself that means whether it tends to dominate in the population or not. It's not the individual genes. They will tend to throw away genes that they don't really need. And the host cell itself has got its agenda. It needs to make sure that it's getting benefits from this symbiont, that it's not being taken over, it's not being eaten. And so it's much, at least, more intuitive to think of the interests of the cells themselves. And if you simply think of all of them as genes, then you don't have that discrimination between, between the layers. Again, if you're thinking about protocells at the origin of life, the unit of selection, in my mind, 
is can a cell make a copy of itself? If you have a, if you have a pure why cell? RNA why not, world... Why, why cell? Why not gene? Or well, why not half a gene? Or why not a yeah, quarter of a gene? There, there's been plenty of work done on RNA replicators. And they have a tendency to <clears throat> become smaller and simpler and effectively better able to make copies of themselves with whatever you provide them in the environment. And they end up with a thing called Spiegelman's monster, uh, which is basically the the binding sequence to the RNA polymerase, which allows it to furiously replicate away. Um, now, would, now well, if I provide them with that, then yes. they would disappear? Well, if you take that away, then now, they if can't I give grow that at all. To them so if, you're the providing, if you're providing in the environment an RNA polymerase and an infinite supply of nucleotides, then yes, they, they become simpler and simpler and faster and faster at copying. Well, then the environment <clears> becomes the life form. In effect. The trouble is there isn't ever going to be an environment that's providing that for you, except in a cellular context. Now, if we, there's some modeling wait, wait, work, why do you say that? Why do you say that? Because <clears throat> if you're selecting at the level of genetic replication, the, the replicators that are better able to make copies of themselves fast are those which are in effect the most selfish and the, the least likely to cooperate to try and convert the environment into metabolism. The only way <clears throat> that you can really get a selfish replicator to be unselfish is to put it in a bag with a bunch of other selfish replicators. Um, and, and then they're more or less obliged to cooperate. So, so if, you, if you think of it from a, from a proto-cell point of view, the, the, the selfish replicators which are best at making copies of themselves are necessarily those that are best able to make the entire proto-cell replicate itself. Now, let's get a little bit more planetary here. <clears throat> you, you mentioned that on Earth you thought that complexity had increased and that a flea was more complex than these bacteria. Now, in its morphology. In its yeah. morphology, yes, but not in its chemistry. So let's, set, let's fill up the universe with Earths that have, let's say, life and cellular life and let's call it bacterial life of some kind. Mm -hmm. uh, and then say, what would happen then? Do you think there's any type of universality to the evolution towards morphological complexity? And what, if that were the case, yes. then you would see it all over the place. What I think I would say with some degree of certainty from the example of life on Earth is that if you simply have a population of bacteria, uh, that the chances of it giving rise to the kind of morphological complexity I'm talking about, which is what we see in eukaryotic cells and we do not see in bacteria, is remote. Remote? Uh, Why do you say that? Well, because bacteria and archaea, if you look at the amount of genetic variation, they, they dwarf the genetic variation that we see in eukaryotes. They have explored <coughs> genetic sequence space to, to you know, orders of magnitude greater than eukaryotes did. And despite exploring all of that space, they haven't come up with morphological complexity. Plainly, but they, wait, they, they, but they you know, did they, come up with it. <coughs> well, they did through an endosymbiosis. Right, which seems to be fairly common because we see well, multiple not between, examples. Not of... between prokaryotes. It's rare between prokaryotes, rare to the point of we know, we know of one example <coughs> of free living bacteria with bacterial cells living inside it. We know of two other examples where there's a mealybug, for example, uh, which, which has inside its own cells, it has some, I think, gamma proteobacteria with beta proteobacteria living inside them. It's a little bit of a strange system and it's hard to know, again, can you generalize from this because it's all inside a Russian doll. Uh, so this one example of free living cyanobacteria as it happens with bacteria living inside it, it wasn't phagocytosis, it's got a cell wall and it's not a phagocyte. So they can get inside, but we could say for sure it's rare. What does it do? Um, in a nutshell, it changes the topology of the cell. It allows you to internalize respiration and it's not just internalizing the membranes, it's internalizing a genetic control system with mitochondrial DNA in our own case. Um, which by standard selection is whittled down to a kind of minimum unit required to do the job. And that in effect allows the nuclear genome to expand up to anything it wants to be. So it's a change, it's a structural change. It's not something which you can find by genetic exploration of evolutionary space. It's something which you change the topology of a cell. And once, once you've got that, you've got bacteria living inside another bacterial cell. You've got to fight on your hands. They've got to get along with each other somehow. So the chances of it going wrong is quite high. So I would imagine if we know of one or two examples now, there must have been thousands, millions, billions of cases of this over Earth history. The fact that we all, 
all this searching across the earth that we've done for life, we find bacteria, we find archaea, we find these candidate phyla, we're not sure what they are exactly, but they seem to be very simple and probably symbionts. Uh, and and we, we see eukaryotic cells. All the cases that appear to be potentially evolutionary intermediate, something slightly different, have turned out to be highly derived uh, you know, from more complex ancestors. Well, it, I, but my question is not about how highly derived they are. The question is how likely is it that well, they would occur would, elsewhere, this derivation? Yes, I would say that if, if there's a probability of life being cellular, which I think there is, life being carbon-based, which I think there is, life starting out with CO2, because it's so common in planetary atmospheres, and hydrogen, which is a very mm -hmm. common, uh, from, from the kind of hydrothermal vents I'm talking about. And what, liquid they water? Don't re and liquid water. They don't re you need liquid water for this serpentinization, but we know of it on Enceladus, we know on, on, on uh, Europa. But why do you need serpentinization? Well, that's giving rise to alkaline fluids with hydrogen I gas. See. Most I hydrogen see. gas you find alkaline in the planetary fluids with atmosphere hydrogen gas. are see. coming from, from serpentinization. Olivine, which is the mineral required for that all kind right. of thing, is, is ubiquitous in interstellar all dust. All right. So let's say that all the, what you just so said is everywhere. All of, now this, the question is, all of this pushes you down a certain avenue. Okay. And if that's correct, then it gives you bacteria. Right. And if that's correct, then bacteria have a structural problem and they're not going to get beyond bacteria except with an endosymbiosis. And okay. that in itself is improbable, unlikely. How do you know and, that? because it only happened once to our knowledge on Earth. I thought we at least have mitochondria, we have plastids. Well, they, the we plastids have... were acquired by, by a, a eukaryotic cell that was already a fully fledged eukaryotic cell. So acquiring... Mitochondria get... automatically makes you a eukaryote. No, no. I think acquiring mitochondria gives you a, a headache uh, <laughs> that, that can go wrong very easily. <coughs> but but here's, the, here's, here's, the, here's an interesting problem in a nutshell. You look at a plant cell under a microscope, or an animal cell, or a fungal cell, or an amoeba or something, and you'll recognize the same structures in all of them. They've all got a nucleus, they've all got the genes of straight chromosomes, they've all got telomeres, they've all got centromeres, they've all got nuclear pore complexes, they all do mitosis as a, as a division mechanism, they all do meiosis as two steps where you first double everything and then half it twice. They all go through the same rigmarole, they've all got mitochondria, they've all got the same membrane systems, endoplasmic reticulum, things like that. Um, you know, you could list page after page after page in a textbook and it would be exactly the same for a plant or a fungal cell or an mm -hmm, animal cell. Mm -hmm. Now they have really different ways of life. If you were to simply think, well, there's some inevitability that, that bacteria will give rise to complex life. Let's say, well, you would imagine that a, that a photosynthetic bacteria, cyanobacteria, would give rise directly to photosynthetic algae, eukaryotic algae but they didn't. It was by the intermediary of acquisition of a chloroplast. There was a common ancestor of eukaryotes that was nothing like a cyanobacterium and nothing, well, quite like an alga except without the chloroplasts. So why? Why is it that we all have this same machinery inside, but we have such different lifestyles? Why don't we see multiple origins of complex life where cyanobacteria give rise to post photosynthetic but trees? But wait, 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 you said- Why you don't used, we see- You used the word lifestyle. Bacteria. You used yeah. the word lifestyle. And then you said, oh, by the way, our, meta, our chemical complexity is really, really simple. And now you're trying to say, oh, there's a lot of variety in our lifestyle. Well, now, yes. then, then you so, said, well, there's a lot of variety in the morphology, but not yes. in the chemistry. Well, the lifestyle, these are all lifestyles that exist in bacteria anyway. Yeah. So photosynthesis, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the only, the only eukaryotic lifestyle that does not exist at all in bacteria is phagocytosis, so the ability to engulf other cells, to grow around them. Um, that's never been found yet in bacteria. It seems to require you know, a lot of energy, a large complicated system capable of changing shape and moving around. It's, you know, for whatever reasons, it never evolved. I would say the reason was that you need mitochondria to get that large and complex in the first place. Well, maybe it has evolved and we just don't know it and we well, haven't located that yet. Is that been, a possibility? It's a possibility and it, you know, a single discovery tomorrow could disprove everything I'm saying now. That's quite thrilling. But um, how, how thoroughly have we looked? Obviously question. not nearly thoroughly enough yet. On the other hand, we have been looking for you know, several hundred years since, mm -hmm. uh, since Leeuwenhoek, and we've not found anything really shocking that falls out of the system we know. So th just, just to finish what I was saying, we all share this basic machinery in cells, and it's not related to whether you're photosynthetic or whether you're a phagocyte or whether you are a fungus or whether you're an animal cell. We all share the same machinery. Why? 
the possibility is that it, it's not about adaptation to the external world, it's about adaptation to these endosymbionts, these pesky bacteria that went on to become our mitochondria. Maybe this conflict of interest, this, this uh, had to be resolved somehow, was what was driving a lot of the, the elaboration of cellular machinery. It's, it's a kind of local conflict, intimate conflict. So let me try to summarize. I asked you the question, if we assume that there's bacteria everywhere on all these earths that we're finding, you think that the step from back prokaryotes to eukaryotes, I guess an endosymbiotic event, which is a, what you described as a topological event, you think that is quirky or rare enough so that we should not expect eukaryotes or complex morphology elsewhere? I wouldn't say statistically it happened here. I don't think we have a statistical basis. What I would say is that I wouldn't expect populations of bacteria to give rise without endosymbiosis to complex morphology and the kind of intelligence that we have elsewhere. I think that it would require, I'm going out on a limb here, but I think it requires an endosymbiosis for the reasons I've been saying, and that that endosymbiosis is A, rare, and B, likely to go wrong. So. I can't put a number on how improbable it is, it's just that I would say that it, it, it's, a, it's a factor that a lot of people would rather not think about. If you have an agenda where you'd like to find complex life out there, the SETI people, for example, probably don't really want to hear this kind of stuff. Um, it, it says that it's less likely, it's not an inevitable outcome of, of physics. Let's so say. is this eukaryotic bottleneck your favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? I think there's plenty of solutions to Fermi's paradox that we don't need to add this as an extra one, but yes, it would be my favorite explanation for it, that there is no inevitability about complex life, that there's nothing in the laws of cosmology that say life will start. I think there probably is something in the laws of cosmology lending itself towards bacteria, uh, but the idea of more complex life, I certainly wouldn't see a Simon Conway Morris view, for example, that that uh, the origin of life is so complex that you require God to, to, to put everything in motion and then convergent evolution will take you all the way to humans. Now, as a bacteria, I feel offended by you saying that I'm not complex. Uh, I because said you're I not morphologically a... complex. You're biochemically <laughs> awesome. I see. <laughs> well, and you see no equivalent barrier between, I guess, let's say viruses and bacterial complexity. We're getting into a numbers game here. I, I suspect that, uh, it, I mean, it's interesting to me that the, the, the bacteriophages, the viruses that you find in bacteria, are not remotely similar to the ones that you find infecting archaea, uh, which again, are not remotely similar to eukaryotic viruses. So it's interesting that- What's the biggest difference between those two bacteriophages and archaeophages or something? Well, they're different in their appearance. They're different in the mechanisms in which they force their, their interaction. I mean, the bacteriophages are these classic lunar lander module things mm -hmm. that, uh, that, 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 you know, they, they, they are stunning things to look at. Yeah. There's some, back, uh, some archaeal viruses look like bottles or, some, or, really? or, or, or postage stamps. There's some oh, strange gosh. shapes. They, they're not like these lunar landers. Oh, oh. They don't have any genes in common. They don't have mechanisms of entry into cells in common. They appear to be independently derived. Uh, ah, so independently derived, so I can't make a phylogenetic tree of viruses? That's why they're not in the tree of life. They don't relate in a very direct way. Well, they're not way. in the tree of life because they don't have ribosomes, and that's what's Yes, best. but the tree of life now is not only about ribosomes. You can build trees from whole genomes, but, yeah. but viral genomes, you know, they don't really fit in in a way which, which okay. makes sense to people. Uh, now, if I gave you $100 billion with the caveat <laughs> that you had to spend this gigantic amount of money to help answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? I have absolutely no idea. Uh, I mean, I have no conception of what $100 billion is. That's uh, a lot of money. If you a billion you dollars, I, I give you I a lot would, of money. I would have no idea. Uh, what would I do? I, I, would, I would like to address my own questions, and I couldn't possibly spend that much money on my own questions. You know, a few, few million would, would, would get me down the next five years, and who knows where I am in five years' time. So I, you know, I, I would love to have a few million to ask the kind of questions I'm asking, build some high pressure reactors and try these things. The rest of it, um, I think there's, I, I've been asked on various occasions, why don't we as an origins of life community get together, think what the killer experiment is and then go and build a CERN or something where, where, where we, we go and do the experiments. And the, and the answer to that is, well, we can't agree with each other about what, what experiment would you do? Uh, and it, it's, it is intrinsically a lot more complex for be precisely because it's a continuum. 
we don't know, we don't agree about what environment, we don't agree about what kind of chemistry or biochemistry, we can't join these things up. And so it seems to me a much healthier environment is to be deliberately um, multiple about it, not to say, okay, you know, this, this particular world view is going to dominate. I think we have to have multiple views until we know more. Uh, and so I suppose if I had billions, I, I would probably either... I don't think I'd put it into a single institute because that would tend to funnel people into thinking similar ways. I think I would like to fund people around the world with radically different ideas, most of whom would disagree with me, um, along with funding people who agree with me to, 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 you know, I think these are big science questions. I couldn't spend that money myself and I wouldn't want to put it into some kind of machine or an institute or something. I, I, would, I would put it to people who I thought were deserving. Any money for SETI? Yes. Any money for uh, electron microscopes to find nano aliens? Yes. Any money for philosophers? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I, I like philosophers. I think they, they can teach scientists how to think very often. And I, I, you know, there's a lot of sloppy thinking among scientists, and I think philosophers can be quite rigorous about it. It gets a lot of scientists cross the philosophers who don't engage with science, but I think there's more philosophers these days who are engaging in a serious way with science. And uh, I think they, 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 have, they have important things to say. Many physicists, for example, Martin Rees, thinks that it's silly for us to go around looking for life on other planets because life will become post-biological like we think we will become, and therefore there's no reason to believe that we will be uh, concentrated on the surface of a planet. We'll be everywhere all the time. We don't need this bag of water. Um, so what are your views on that? Well, he may well be right. Um, if we were to go back five million years as intelligent apes and ask ourselves what is post-biological life I think the answer is it's you know it's not a concept that, that would possibly mean anything so we've had you know four billion years of life on earth and, and it's come up with an enormous wealth and variation but it's all organic and, and you know the chances of it coming up with humans I can't put a number on that I, what I was saying before I don't think there's an inevitability that life, once it's started, will give rise to a human-like intelligence or, or, or beyond that. I think there's nothing inevitable about it. And if we just go back a few million years on Earth, there was nothing inevitable about it. So I personally would still look for organic life, but as I say, I, I, I'm not sure that would be the easiest thing to find. It may be that it's easier to find, yes, nano-aliens or something. So I asked you a question about post-biological life, and you answered mostly with, about the evolution, the likelihood of the evolution of human-like intelligence. So let's talk about human-like intelligence. We know that we got big and our brains increased by a factor of three in the last three million years or so. Um, as a biologist, do you think that there's, that's a convergent feature? A lot of th people would say intelligence is so important that that should happen elsewhere. On the other hand, other people say, well, if it should happen elsewhere, it should have happened multiple times on Earth and we haven't seen that. And other people say, well, wait a minute, we have seen there are lots of other intelligent species on Earth. So how do you disentangle those opinions? Uh, I do agree with the people who say there are plenty of intelligent beings on Earth, um, but none of them are human-like in their intelligence. I mean, I think we, we can well, have a great deal of... none of them are mouse-like either. None of them are dog-like. Yeah, but I, I, you know, the fact is that dogs are not building rockets. Um, neither are dolphins. Now, you know, maybe it's opposable thumbs rather than brain size that's the answer. Maybe there's a few aspects uh, that, that, that make it possible. But, you know, why, why wouldn't an octopus, uh, which has got presumably as much dexterity as it, as it could possibly wish to have, could it be in a different universe or different, different setting that uh, the octopuses could achieve that level of intelligence? I don't see why not. I mean, I, I don't think there's anything blocking it. I think I would see them as conscious. I would see them as intelligent. Well, let's um, ask the Planet of the Apes question. Let's wipe ourselves out. Humans all dead. And yeah. then in the Planet of the Apes movie, the chimpanzees and the gorillas, the three other great apes become, they start to inhabit the intelligence niche, if there is such a thing. Uh, let's run that experiment on Earth. It is a thought experiment. We what do you already. think would happen? Where well, we might, may soon do that. Uh, what do you think would happen? Which would, do you think there is an intelligence niche into which some other creature would evolve? There plainly is an intelligence niche because we're in it. Do I think that there's an inevitability about it being filled? No, I think it's more likely it would not be filled. 
Um, now, when you say a niche, it usually implies something general. That, for example, the English language is very specific. No one would talk about an English language niche, right? And so my view of human-like intelligence is so narrow, it's more like the English language. But most people think, oh, no, there's, it's much more generic than that. Where, where do you Well, when stand? I'm talking about a human-like intelligence, I'm thinking of post-biology. I'm thinking of creation of Technology. technologies that, are, uh, that, that, that go beyond anything that humans can do now. So then the question is, well, can a dolphin do that? Can, a, can an ape do that? Can, a, can an octopus do it? Maybe not now, but let's take the humans out and give another two billion years. Two billion? It's, is it going to happen in that two billion year time? Well, we, you know, we've, we've had, since the Cambrian explosion, 550 million years. It's only happened once and quite recently. Uh, we've had pretty sophisticated animals around a lot of that time. So I certainly wouldn't see any inevitability about it. I have a feeling, but I don't know, I don't work on this, but I have a feeling that there were a bunch of unusual factors during early human evolution which nudged us in this particular direction. Well, the question is, how unusual? Again, it's a numbers game because we're talking about human-like intelligence we're elsewhere. Back to, we're back to conjuring with, a, with, a, with, a, with an N of one, so it's hard to know, isn't it? Well, no, because humans, and we, our brains increased in size over three million years in a particular continent. There were New Zealand, and then there was uh, Madagascar and there was South America, all of which were independent experiments in macroscopic vertebrate evolution, and they did not show a pattern of, hey, the, the, there wasn't an intelligence niche into which something evolved during 50, 70, 80 million years, which is much longer than the 3 million years which we think we used to well, evolve. Which is why I say that plainly there's a niche because we're in it, but uh, I don't well, think that there's somebody, ine well, any inevitability. I mean, there are plenty of possible directions evolution could go. But I think evolution tends towards stasis rather than change. Well, I, I would push back on that and say, just because you have adaptations does not mean that your adaptations are general enough to be called a niche. That's why I use this English language version. Yeah. I speak I, English, I, but I would not call it the English niche. And so that's what, so yes, I view but, human yes, intelligence but, as very- but, 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 but language is the niche. Is there, is there, well, that's is, is there something about, about sophisticated verbal language, human-like language, uh, which is in somehow, some way better than other types of signaling? I, I don't know. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm way out of my comfort level oh. with this, but uh, <coughs> my feeling is that there's no, no reason to expect, given the history of life on Earth, that we would, we would see intelligence as capable of going to a kind of post-biology level of sophistication as an inevitable outcome of life on or, the planet. Or how about just making telescopes? Just making biology. telescopes, yeah, just that's making... quite a long way. I find it hard to imagine an octopus making a telescope. So if we kill all humans, how long will it be before a telescope will be manufactured by some other species which would evolve towards into this intelligence niche? <laughs> if we kill all humans, what I expect would happen is that within, I mean, I, I think we'll melt down a lot of the biosphere, but there'll be enough of it left to within five million years to be back where we started without humans, perhaps without mammals, who knows? Perhaps we'll take out all large mammals and things as we know, but I, I think there's enough convergent evolution that we would end up within five to 10 million years with a world not so very different to what the world might have looked like 10 million years ago. But that's not my question. My question think, is telescopes. I don't think that that world is gonna come up with a telescope in hundreds of millions of years because I think there's no, there's no direction towards it. There's, no, there's nothing about evolution that says, you know, the end point is a telescope. A lot yeah, of the physicists would disagree just, with that biological opinion. I'm sure they would, and good, good luck to them. <laughs> okay. I don't like that opinion. It's just as a biologist, that's what I see in the world. Right, right. Well, that's what, <clears throat> that's what Ernst Mayer would say, I think, in the debates he had with Carl Sagan. Yeah. Um, now, in astrobiology, there's a kind of a logic that says, if something has evolved multiple times independently on Earth, then those, that thing, whatever it is, becomes a good candidate for what we should expect elsewhere. What do you think of that logic? I like that logic. I think there's truth in it. Uh, it, it requires that, um, that life elsewhere should be modeled along similar lines to life here, which is to say it should be cellular, it should be carbon-based, it should be in water. If those things are not true, then there's no reason why that numbers game would apply anywhere else. But if those things are true, then yes, I think the fact that photosynthesis only arose once, that eukaryotes only arose once, that what uh, Nick Butterfield calls organ-grade multicellularity, which is to say quite serious differentiation with, with, with scores of different cell types and specializations. We don't see that in fungi, we don't see that in algae. We, you know, you, you see two or three different types of cell. 
so that's rare. It's, it's in plants and it's in animals. It begins to look less likely. I think it's reasonable to say it's less likely, but I wouldn't like to rely too much on, put too much weight on it. Well, how about this debate about uh, whether we do see convergence, as Simon Connolly Morris would say, and I would have pushed back on this and said, that's not convergence, that's deep homology. You, in order to talk about convergence, you have to talk about divergence first because we all, have a, we all agree that life had a common source. Yeah, yeah. What do you think about this uh, controversy between deep homology and convergent thinking? <clears throat> I mean, I suppose a classic case of convergence would be the octopus eye and the human eye, or mammalian eyes. And I would and say it's a classic it. case of deep homology. No, I would say that it's not. Um, okay, let's so, argue. So, so uh, the reason I say it's not is the common ancestor that they had had a light-sensitive spot. It had some regulatory genes in common. So there's a gene called Pax6, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. But that had to effectively independently recruit all the rest of the genes required to make a camera-type eye. Um, and that, that direction of evolutionary travel was, was in parallel. It was, it was convergent. We even see in some protists... Well, uh, we see a camera type eye in single celled critters uh, where the, there's a retina made from chloroplasts, there's a, there's, a, there's a cornea made from mitochondria, there's a lens there, they don't have a brain. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how they use this thing, but it's, you know, plainly it's a camera type eye. And what organism is this? I don't recall the organism, it's a diatom of some sort. Okay. 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 But it's very neat. So I would see that as a completely independent origin of a camera type eye, albeit without a brain. I would see the octopus as, and, and, and mammalian eyes as being convergent in the Simon Conway Morris sense that there are certain ways that you can make an eye um, that work. And all the steps along the way have to be favored. And you know, perhaps there's seven or eight different types of eye, fundamentally different types of eye that we see on Earth. And most of them have arisen more than once. How about the IR dynamic? All, always from a, from a common ancestor, generally, that, that had rhodopsin as a light sensitive pigment. So you're then into an interesting terrain, or, you know, how, how common are the right types of light sensitive pigment? They're chemically not so straightforward. Okay, how about the hydrodynamic shape of like an ichthyosaur and a dolphin or something? Um, I don't know enough, but I would see that as convergent, given that both had, to my knowledge, terrestrial uh, ancestors, so they must have adapted to that lifestyle independently, I think. Okay, what, let's ask you an emotional question here. What kind of aliens would you like to find? Close your <laughs> eyes and just feel. Well, I, I do like this quote from Simon Conway Morris, that if the aliens call, then don't pick up the phone. Uh, I'm not sure I'd really like to meet any of them very much. Um, Perhaps from that point of view, meeting bacteria would be the least scary thing to meet. Um, I, I, th I suppose that I think the chances of us meeting intelligent aliens is so remote that I haven't really troubled myself very much about it. Uh, uh, so it you... would be nice to think that if we did, somehow they would be a superior intelligence, somehow they would be... Uh, they, they would have solved a lot of the problems of aggression and whatever else that humans have, but uh, I, I fear not. I fear it would be the opposite, that they would... Natural selection has a knack of producing nastiness in intelligence. So you agree with Simon Conway Morris, if they call, don't pick up the phone? I, I, I'm afraid so, yes. <laughs> so, so that's Stephen Hawking also said, keep your head down. Yeah, it seems like there's a so few you, of us. Okay. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> what, what kind of alien would you like to meet? <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, have you ever seen a UFO? No. Have you ever been abducted by an alien? No, unfortunately not. Do you have a favorite alien movie? Um, well, the original alien movie was uh, very scary. The original uh, one? I, I don't... You know, with Meryl Streep and the bad alien. No, no, Aliens. Which... I'm thinking of Aliens, the movie. Which one is that? I it mean... wasn't Meryl Streep. Which one? Is uh, it a bad alien or a good alien? Bad alien. A bad alien, okay. Yes. All right, yeah, it wasn't Meryl Streep. Um, now, in the movie, you've seen the movie Contact? Um, no, I haven't. It's based on the Carl Sagan novel. Anyway, at the end of the movie, a little child asks Jodie, Jodie Foster, who has just contacted aliens and talked to them and had some wonderful experiences, a little kid asks, just like Jodie Foster did when she was a child, um, are we alone? And the, she answers, well, if we are, it would be an awful waste of space. <laughs> what do you think of that? Uh, emotive, um, 
does anyone care if there's an awful lot of wasted space? I, I don't, I, again, it, 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 it's, it's a form of wishful thinking, that's what I think of that. I, we would love for the universe to be full. We would love, I think most of Wait us... Wait a minute, you just said you're afraid of the universe being full. We of... would love it to be, you know, personally, I grew up on Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, those kind of uh, you know, cr crazy science fiction yarns or Star Wars or whatever it may be, the idea that the universe is full of other intelligent beings, all kind of finding a way of getting along or having a war, but having some heroism thrown in. You know, it's all, you know, it's all human vision of ourselves thrown onto a, onto a cosmic scale. Um, do I believe any of it? No, I don't believe any of it. Is there anything that I think from my understanding as a biologist that would tend to lead to that? No, I'm afraid I don't see that either. Does it matter if it's a tremendous waste of space? Well, that's to say, what's the point of the Big Bang? Um, I, I don't know. Um, but the idea that the universe may be completely empty apart from matter and energy would seem to be perhaps the default hypothesis. The fact that we, we find life is surprising. It would be nice if there were laws of the universe that tended to give rise to life. Uh, maybe there are at the level of bacteria. I don't see it at the level of large morphologically complex beings. And so, uh, you know, I think it's emotive, it's pleasing, but I doubt it's true. What do you think are the public's or your students' biggest misconceptions about the question, are we long? I'm a little bit embarrassed to say, but I'm not sure that I raise that question with very many students. Well, you're um, exposed to their assumptions, and some of them you must think, oh, that's a good one, and others, oh, that's the craziest assumption. You shouldn't assume that. Uh, yeah. I think it makes me realize that most of what I teach and interact with the students is more about life on Earth and, and, and the, the, the principles governing evolution. Um, from my own point of view, the biochemical side, which is not normally part of evolutionary biology, and so it's relatively rare for me to discuss life elsewhere in the universe with them. Really? So even though you're talking about the origin of life, not necessarily j just, I mean, it seemed to me that part of your motivation for studying the origin of life was your desire to be able to say, hey, this is a general thing, not just a specific thing that happened on Earth. I think the problem here for me is that I'm in a biology department and astrobiology is still somewhat frowned upon by a lot of biologists who would see it as a form of speculation. Uh, so the courses that I teach are about life on Earth, and they're, they're not so much about life in the universe. And uh, it is something that I should develop, I think. There are people at UCL, Ian Crawford, who's, who's doing a great deal for, for astrobiology. Um, but n it's not something which is happening through my department. It's happening through planetary sciences. It's not happening in biological So you're teaching, though, the origin of life in a biology, yeah. and it never occurs to your students to say, is this or is it not extrapolatable to well, other planets? Well, I've had long and sometimes difficult discussions, especially about the singularity of the origin of eukaryotes. Is this, you know, a lot of people don't like that. Uh, again, it's not really about what does it say about the probability of life elsewhere, although it has things to say to that. It's really about the life on Earth. A lot of people are very uncomfortable with the idea of improbability. Um, and, and so I, I've had quite difficult discussions with some students about that, but uh, rarely, really, about uh, life elsewhere in the universe. Do you have any advice for students who are thinking about becoming astrobiologists? and in dedicating their lives to trying to answer this question, are we alone? Uh, do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's one of the probably argumentative disciplines, but it's one of the places where so many different disciplines of science naturally come together, where you're obliged to be out of your comfort zone a lot of the time, where you're talking to people who see the world in a very different way uh, and, and, and force you to rethink your own uh, your own perspective on it, um, it's a melting pot. And I, I think it brings the best of science and I think it overthrows the old disciplinarian view that you know, you're know you in biology a zoologist or a botanist or whatever it may be. I, I, I think I, I, I see myself as a biologist or a biochemist, but I think in, in the context of astrobiology as a, as, a, as a broader subject, it forces me to wrestle with physics, with cosmology, with chemistry, with geology, with earth sciences or with planetary sciences. Um, and that's a thrill. That's, uh, I think it's what most people are drawn into science in the first place for because science in its, in its biggest sense is what inspires people. Uh, and by the time you got to the level of doing a PhD, it's narrowed down so much that a lot of people are almost forced to lose their imagination and their creativity as a scientist. And I think astrobiology is a subject that 
puts all that back in in heaps. Wow. Okay. And so, uh, are we alone in the universe? <laughs> no, we're not alone. Um, <laughs> we share it with lots of friendly bacteria. And this is bacteria on other planets. Yes. 